someone comes in your office and it doesn't have to be anymore a secretary who works on a typewriter. I don't even know if you guys know what a typewriter is. But we all have computers and the patient tells you, I have unbelievable pain and tingling in my hand. Okay, fair enough. And I know what you're thinking, carpal tunnel syndrome. And you'll likely be correct, but there are certain things that you've got to know. First of all, in carpal tunnel syndrome, you need to understand that the anatomy of the median nerve is perfect. What do I mean by that? Guys, if they have pain and tingling on the back of their hand, it ain't carpal tunnel. If they have pain and tingling in their baby finger, their fifth finger, it ain't carpal tunnel. The median nerve is anatomically perfect. So first of all, you have to just ask them exactly where is your pain and tingling? And if they tell you it's in their baby finger or the back of their hand, it's not likely to be carpal tunnel. Secondly, you have all learned the two physical examinations for carpal tunnel, Tunnel sign and Phelan sign. Tunnel sign, remember you tap on the flexor retinaculum to get symptoms. Phelan sign, go like this, you get symptoms. They're not reliable signs. Yeah, you do them. Will they be on your test? Yeah. But if they're negative, meaning normal, they don't reproduce the symptoms, does it mean they don't have carpal tunnel? No. Every time you are thinking about carpal tunnel, you have to, you have to think about three other diagnoses, test question and life question. The three other diagnoses that can mimic a carpal tunnel, number one, cervical radiculopathy. With arthritis, common, unbelievable. Cervical radiculopathy. Number two, tendinitis. Tendinitis. Common, yeah. And number three, wrist arthritis. So remember that even though common things happen commonly, I've already taught you if you hear hoofbeats, don't think of zebras. Those three diagnoses, cervical radiculopathy, tendinitis, and wrist arthritis are common have to always think about that. Now, how do we treat all of those? We usually treat all of those. We start with rest, whether that be a splint or a soft collar, sometimes steroid, I'm a pulse of steroid, sometimes a steroid injection, and to see what happens clinically, what happens. And that is very, very fair. But if, but if are going to operate on a patient for presumed diagnosis of carpal tunnel, in other words, the patient comes in and they don't have significant cervicalopathy or tendinitis or wrist arthritis and they anatomically, that median nerve is where they're complaining and they say that they're sitting on their computer and hours and hours and hours and you gave them NSAIDs and you gave them a splint and you gave them a steroid pulse or even a steroid injection and they say, Dr. Hill, before you operate, you have to get two tests and they both be abnormal before you operate. Those two tests are number one, nerve conduction velocity. That's number one. Number two, EMG, electromyography. 
that better be abnormal too. You have to get both of being abnormal, nerve conduction velocity and electromyography have to be abnormal before you operate. Because the worst thing in the world is for you to do the operation, which is not a big deal. You cut the flexor retinaculum, it's not a big deal. But the worst thing in the world is the patient comes back to you post-op and you say, hey, how are you doing? The patient says, well, I got the same symptoms, doctor. That's not good. So you must before and test question in life, or if you are going to do surgery, you got to have those two tests and they better be abnormal. One final thing about carpal tunnel, is it increasing in frequency? Oh yeah. Why? Remember something guys, cavemen did not get carpal tunnel syndrome, meaning this is a man-made disease. Cavemen did not do this motion. They didn't do this. Darwin didn't describe this. Do I think it's gonna get worse? Yeah, why? Because we're on our computers so much of the time, so much of it. I ask my young colleagues and my children, you know, how, how much are you on the computer? And it's hours and hours and hours and hours. And, and, and I, I'm on the computer a lot too. And so I, I just want you to understand that even though they make, uh, what are they called? Ergonomic keyboards that are better uh, in terms of uh, positioning of the hands and, and they're doing all this voice activation and whatever. I, I, I think this is gonna get worse and worse and worse in time, unless they develop somehow a keyboard that, that truly doesn't put your hand in it. This is a very awkward position. It is. All right, that's carpal tunnel. All right, next, a real common thing. A patient comes to you who's usually a middle-aged or older person, and they said, Dr. Hill, sometimes my finger looks like a trigger and it gets stuck there and I have to go like this. Is it common? Oh yeah. And it's actually called trigger finger. And it's just due to arthritic change calcifications in the tendon sheet. And usually we do not operate on this. Sometimes we give um, injections of steroids. It's usually not, it doesn't hurt to go like this but it, it's just weird. I'll, I'll just tell you something interesting. My wife, who is a flight attendant, um, she sometimes gets it. And, and, and I have to, when she gets it and it's in the house, I have, she, can't, she can't stand for, me to, for her to go like this. And so I, I have to do it for her. Cause it's kind of, it doesn't hurt. It's just a weird thing, but it's real common. It's called trigger finger. Next, when you have a baby, you will learn when the baby's little, you will carry the baby with one hand, with one hand like this. You can't carry a baby, you know, over your shoulder and stuff like that, like this. And this is an awkward position for you because remember that little babies, their head is bigger proportionately to their body than when they grow up. And, and so when you have them in this position where you're holding them in your arm, your wrist is not up like this, which is more comfortable for you, because if you had your wrist up like that, the, the kid's head would be like this. And the kid's head is big compared to my, so your wrist is down like this. That's a very uncomfortable position. And many men and women in the early months of carrying a child, a new baby, will get a tenosynovitis. And it has a specific name. And you know this, de Courval tenosynovitis. De Courval 
actinocyanobitis. And it's very simple to diagnose. And what happens is you treat it with uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory agents and splints, and it just goes away. Very rarely do you need to inject steroids. Um, it's just something that's common. And if you talk to anyone who carries their child with one arm as opposed to two, it's common to see this sacral volatinocinovitis. All right. Next, patient comes in and they're either Norwegian or an alcoholic. And don't ask me why. I don't have the definitive answer. If you do, then you will win the Nobel Prize. But either Norwegian or an alcoholic in their hand starts looking like this. And that is called a Dupuytren's contraction. Common, yes. Why it occurs in Norwegians more than um, other, I don't know. In alcoholism, there's a lot of theories. But what happens is when they have a Dupuytren, they don't have pain. And they can go like this, they can make a fist, but they can't straighten up their hand all the way. They can't straighten up their hand all the way. So I want you to do something. Next time, you're going to be taking care of a lot of alcoholics. That's part of being a doctor. Take your finger and rub it on their palm. And many times you will feel nodules in their palmar fascia. You'll feel nodules. And, 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 and a lot of them, you'll start to see their hands are like this. And you'll feel the nodules. We're not sure why they get it. Uh, Dupuytren's, the vast majority of Dupuytren's we leave be because um, the patients are not terribly, terribly disturbed by that, generally speaking. They can go like this. They just can't extend completely and they don't usually have pain. There are medications uh, which possibly can help Surgery is not easy surgery. It requires a hand surgeon. Again, you don't need to know any of this. You only need to know that it, you'll see it commonly and Norwegians and alcoholics. All right. Next, the most important thing I have to teach you about safety. Listen to me carefully. A carpenter or anyone injures themselves in the pulp space, the distal phalanx, the volar aspect, the pulp space of one of their fingers and gets swelling, pain, and infection. Straight away, I want to differentiate this from a paranicheal infection. Guys, paranicheal infections are nothing. People get ingrown uh, uh, nails, they get little uh, infections by their nail. They are nothing, they're easy to deal with. When you have a pulp space infection occurs on the volar aspect of the distal phalanx of any of the fingers, that is called felon, F-E-L-O-N. And my young colleagues, that is a surgical emergency, meaning you don't treat that with antibiotics, you have to drain it. Why? Look, look at your pulp space of any of your fingers, the distal phalanx, your pulp space. It's a closed compartment, very complex with a bunch of whorls and stuff. You know, that's your fingerprints, things like that. You get an infection there and you don't drain it and it will rapidly go up your arm and you will become septic. A 
felon is a surgical emergency. It drives me crazy when I get called by one of my colleagues who says, Mark, I got a patient who's got this weird paronychial infection and it's not going away with antibiotics. And they come to my office and they have a felon. Guys, a felon is a surgical emergency. It requires drainage. They are on your test. Going to give you two options, antibiotics or surgery, surgery, surgery. So now I'm going to tell you a story. This is kind of an interesting story. When I first went into practice 38 years ago, I joined a great man who was the best surgeon I'd ever seen or experienced in my life. And we were very, very close until he passed. He was like a father to me. And, and it's interesting, his father, his name was uh, Dr. Stein Jr. His father was Stein Sr., an OBGYN doctor who was the sign of Stein Levenfall syndrome, polycystic ovaries, just to let you know. Anyway, when I joined him, and we routinely had office hours six days a week, meaning on Saturdays. I mean, we were, you know, and we still are, you know, very busy. Well, of course, me being the young guy, I took Saturday hours. All right. So one day, and I won't mention any names, being in Chicago, Someone exceedingly famous and in a leadership role at the Chicago Symphony Orchestra came in to my office and he had a felon. Okay. And granted, I knew, even though it was my first year out of my residency, I knew this needed drainage. Okay, fair enough. And, but this man was a very, 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 he's passed away now, but he was a very famous violin player in, in the Chicago Symphony Orchestra in the leadership role. So I happened to ask him, I, I said, I won't mention his name here, but I said, I said, by the way, are you playing tonight? Because it was a Saturday. He said, yes, I am. I said, um, now, which finger is it um, that you have uh, this felon on? It was his index finger of his left hand, which is the hand and finger that he plays and presses the strings with the violin, okay? I'm thinking, oh my God, I am, I am messed up. I'm, if I operate on him and he can't perform, tonight, I'm screwed. If I don't operate on him and he can't perform because of pain, I'm screwed. So I'll tell you a story. I am talkative by nature. My late partner was very, very quiet. And so I called him up and I said, I have so-and-so here and he's performing tonight and he has a felon of his left index finger. You know, what should I do? And my late partner said to me, Mark, do what you think is best, click. Oh God. And so I was really, really, I remember this like it was yesterday. And what I asked this, very, very nice uh, and famous violinist. I said, tell me exactly where you press on the string for the, when you play. And he showed me and what happened was I drained it as far away from that area as I could. And I was waiting the next morning for the Chicago Tribune, which is the, the big uh, uh, newspaper here, for the reviews of the symphony and thank God, thank God that it did okay. 
Why do I go through this story and tell you this? I don't ever want you to forget this. If anyone ever comes to you with a felon, it is a surgical emergency. You can't put on antibiotics. You can't wait till the next day. You got to deal with it straight away. All right. Very, very good. Another trauma that's real common. Someone is skiing. I'm not a snow skier, but I know that sometimes when you're using poles, and I guess some skiers don't even use poles anymore, if you catch your thumb and you pull it back, that injury injures the, you got to know this, ulnar collateral ligament. Ulnar collateral ligament. And you have to immobilize that thumb. Otherwise, you'll get arthritis, ulnar collateral ligament. And you know what that injury is called, and you'll be telling, they'll use this on the test. It's called a gamekeeper's thumb, a gamekeeper's thumb. Meaning, the reason it's called a gamekeeper's thumb is they used to break chicken's necks like this. They, they go like this. And they would get ulnar collateral ligament injuries. So it's called a gamekeeper's thumb, but it's an ulnar collateral ligament injury. And whatever trauma you have that pulls your thumb back, the most common is um, skiing. But I will tell you, one of my best friends is the chief of police. He's got big hands, big guy. And he has bad arthritis in the joints of his thumb. And do you know how he got bad arthritis? By, you know, he's always having to practice with his handguns, shooting right and left and with guns, meaning the recoil, the recoil. And, and guys, um, uh, just again, not to teach you about firearms or ballistics. Nowadays, uh, the police will use something called a nine millimeter, which is a more controllable uh, uh, round. It has less recoil. But in years past, like with my uh, best friend who, who, who was chief of police, they used to use routinely either 45 caliber or 357 magnums or 40 caliber, uh, which um, are all high recoil, felt recoil is very, very significant. So I just want to tell you that it, it happens to people who don't ski as well, but it's most commonly done by skiing. Someone grabs someone's jersey and they pull away and the person has a finger that they cannot flex at the distal interphalangeal joint. They can't do this. They can't do this. They tore the flexor tendon. They tore traumatically by someone grabbing it, pulling away, they tore the flexor tendon and that finger is called a Jersey finger. Now, I always thought that it was called a Jersey finger because someone in New Jersey happened to name it, but it's not. It's called because Jersey, because grabbing a Jersey. And guys, I'll bet you it's happened to you in a mild way. Have you ever, for any reason, held on to something like a Jersey and it pulls away and you kind of feel pain in your distal phalanx? Well, it's, it's, it's not a Jersey finger, but it shows you that that flexor tendon is a little bit delicate. And the treatment of a Jersey finger where the flexor tendon is ruptured is just splinting it for six weeks and it heals. The other type of finger injury, which is very common, is when you get hit in the fingers by a basketball or a soccer ball, and all of a sudden, your finger looks like a mallet, a mallet, meaning the extensor tendon 
the extensor tendon is ruptured. Now, is that called what? A mallet finger. Is it common? Yes. And in Chicago, it's really common. Do you know why? I'll bet you you don't. If you've ever played softball, in most parts of the country, a softball is a 12 inch ball where you use a baseball mitt. It's a 12 inch ball. But in Chicago, and it's very unique to Chicago, growing up and current day, we don't use 12 inch softballs. We use 16 inch. And I'll bet you a lot of you have never even seen a 16 inch softball. You don't use a baseball mitt with a 16 inch softball. They're not hard, 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 but they're not exactly soft either. They're kind of in between. So you would use your bare hands and we would play softball with a baseball bat and a 16 inch softball. And so since you're not using a baseball mitt, oh, a lot of times when you would have a line drive towards you, it, it, it would hit your fingers like a basketball could or a softball, but this is a 16 inch softball, which is coming at you pretty fast. You get a mallet finger. Treatment for a mallet finger, just like a jersey finger in a splint, six weeks and there you go. So these are common things, mallet fingers and jersey fingers, okay? Finally, Let's talk about when someone cuts off an extremity, a finger, a leg, something like that. Do we have the ability to sew it back on? Yes. Now, when I was your age, this was really rocket science. This was not done commonly and success rate was not great. Nowadays, it's it's not rocket science. It's, it's I wouldn't say it's routine, but it's not uncommon. So when I was your age, if you cut the artery nerve and broke the bone, you would think that the order of the repairs would be artery first, blood supply, then nerves, then the last people would be the orthopods for the bone. And we used to do it that way. And what happened was we found that when the orthopods got there, you know, they have to manipulate the bone and stuff. And what happened was our anastomoses were torn. And it's not because the orthopods were clumsy. That's not true. But orthopods have to move the bone a little bit to get it in the right angle before they fix it. And so therefore, the order in which you deal in a situation where the vascular system, the nervous system and the bones are broken, would mean a replant when you're sewing it back on, is BAN, B-A-N, B-A-N, bone, artery, nerve, the orthopods go first. Bone, artery, nerve. So remember that. And these are called replants. These are called replants. And it happens. And I'm bet you you've had patients who have had perhaps a replant. All right. Very, very, ban, B-A-N, bone, artery, nerve. 